Greetings, welcome back to Case Studies with the BizDoc. And I hate to disappoint you, but we are not covering what happened this week in history. And regardless of when you watch this, this is a weird thing. Kim Kardashian was found buck naked in a tree, taking pictures that she put on Twitter and later deleted. We're not doing a case study on why she did that because we don't have enough time. But what we are doing is taking suggestions from you, and you asked for a long case study, a deep dive on the Blue Apron under the category of what the hell happened? Well, we're exactly what we're gonna do, and we're gonna dive in that today. As usual, let's step back into history and see kind of what happened, and then let's go into why it happened and where I think it went wrong, and more importantly, what you can use and you can learn on your business whether you're making t-shirts for a small company in town or you've built something more substantial, we're gonna have some takeaways that you can learn. And there's two key takeaways this week that I will get to as we dive in here. The two reasons that Blue Apron is tanking. So we go back in the beginning and we have three guys that think it's a pretty good idea to put some ingredients in boxes and be able to ship them to you. So it, along with the recipes, so that you could say, hey, I'm gonna make something interesting. I, I buy it online, it ships to me, certain fruits and vegetables, like an apple or an artichoke and things like that, which ship pretty good. Other things need some refrigeration, but we'll get to that. But we can get going and we can make it make it work. So in 2012, with $800,000 in seed money, Blue Apron is born and they are off and running. And Matt, Ilya, and Matt, the two Matts and the Ilya, you know, get this thing off the ground. Now then they get to Series A in 2013. What's really interesting, if you go back to Crunchbase and you can take a look at this, you're gonna find out that there was a venture capitalist involved from the beginning, Bessemer Venture Partners, a company I know something about. And they would follow along each step of the way, which means that they were believers, not just at the Series A in the early part, but they were believers throughout. So there were some really good and smart people in the room, and I think highly of Bessemer. However, in the end, you know, I think Bessemer gets out, but it wasn't a company that's gonna sustain for the long haul. And there's a point here that is kind of lying under there that I'm gonna dive into in a second. We get now a little bit deeper in 2013, three and five million, so about eight million in 2013. And then 2014, things are going, this is working. Here we go, we did $77 million in sale. Boom, we raise. $50 million at a $500 million valuation. So suddenly this thing, in a couple short years, they think it's worth half a billion dollars. You go one more year and boom, raise $135 million on a $2 billion valuation. Now let's think about that. That's 4X that you just one more year. Well, if you take a look down here, look what was happening to revenue. $77 million in 2014, it would go 10X and be almost $800 million in 2016. So right here, what are they saying? It's a party. People are ordering stuff. We have like almost a million total people that are sending in orders for boxes of things. This is fantastic. You know, we've got a distribution center that was in Richmond, California. We built one in Jersey City a little later. Then we built one in Arlington, Texas. And then even later, we were gonna announce one in Linden, New Jersey. So there was all this growth and everything that was going on. Let's go public, let's go. Well, slow down. Now let's dive into what was going on under the covers beyond all that enthusiasm that gets up here to the IPO. The first was as early as 14, there started to be issues in Richmond, California, and it had to do with, with um, food processing, safety, things like that, because if they're gonna ship you a box of food, you wanna make sure that all that stuff is good and you don't get food poisoning or you get sick or you just don't feel good after the, after the meal. Well, what's the point of ordering it at a premium along with a recipe, put it all together and have issues? Well, nonetheless, it actually started shortly after they opened where they were growing so fast that the food controls and the processes was an issue. And we're gonna see this in a minute in how it bit them in the cost as well. Those violations would come up in 16. Well, in 16, they're getting ready for this IPO. We're gonna go out, we're gonna go. And they go into the quiet period. And what the quiet period is, is once you're gonna go public, all you can say is, I intend to go public and you file a document called an S1 with the Securities Exchange Commission, and then you have to keep your mouth shut, and all these steps are going on in the background as you're getting ready to go public. Well, what also happened along there, along the way, kaboom, 
Amazon announces that it's buying Whole Foods. And what do we know about Amazon? A delivery monolith and an absolute low cost player. So they're low cost, they know how to deliver stuff and they're gonna buy Whole Foods, which means recipe card and creative boxing and everything you put together aside, wow, they're gonna be in the business and they know how to deliver stuff. They're talking about drones delivering batteries to your house. I need two more AA batteries for something. Oh, here comes a drone delivering it. So Amazon's ambitions to be able to deliver anything and everything conveniently at a low cost are very well known. Now they're buying Whole Foods, known for overpriced and some controversy, but known for high quality you know, ingredients, high quality uh, produce that you can depend on, even if it was a little bit overpriced. And at that same time, the IPO comes. So they go out with the IPO literally, literally moments after Amazon announces they're doing this. And no surprise, at 10 bucks a share they go out, and just in these, and this is June of 17, and just in barely, barely 60 days, they are down to five-ish, half of their IPO value. Now this isn't a death sentence, maybe they can make a comeback, but let's go take a look at a few things first. Their value right now is at $1 billion. The valuation here, as you recall, was $2 billion. So you go public after having that kind of a valuation, and shortly after going public, your valuation is 50% of what it was when you took your last venture funding. Man, you've lost half your value, and there's only one word for that, and that is, damn, what's going on? You're supposed to go up when you go public. Well, let's take a look what happens when you go public. When you go public, a lot of the shares get sold to the market. Now there's lockup periods where not everybody can be dumping their shares on the market, but one of the players that always gets out at the IPO, and I shouldn't say always, but almost all the holdings are usually out, is the venture capitalist, because it's their turn to exit. It's gonna go public. They support growth, expansion, proof of concept, uh, early ideation, and so Bessemer proving all this, you know, why shouldn't Bessemer and other investors along the way get their money out? Well, sometimes the criticism of IPOs is, well, the purpose of the IPO was for everybody to jump off the boat and then leave the public markets holding the bag and leave the CFO and everybody who also made money in the IPO standing in front of the microphone explaining themselves every quarter about what the future of the company is. Meanwhile, everybody else is like, see ya, I'm on our way. So what's going on? Is there a future for Blue Apron? Let's go take a look at a couple things. So my first point had to do with growth. I don't think they manage growth well. It was evident about how fast they were opening distribution centers and also the violations kind of proved that there was really a lot of rough around the edges stuff as they were trying to operate those distribution centers. So I don't think that their growth plan really scaled. They were growing so fast that I think it outstripped their ability to do everything really, really well. So the first point was they were so successful, I think their growth plan, growth plan got nicked. The, the second point I think that is happening here is the business model. Because shortly after going public, they announced, well, the actual marketing costs are actually going way up. And they, they announced in a recent quarter, everybody looked stunned as they announced a quarterly result, and they looked at the total marketing costs. I was like, wait, what's going on? You know, historically, was it really this kind of ratio? Does it take this kind of amazing percent of your revenue on marketing costs to make this, this, this business work? And how are you gonna sustain that with Amazon already having a head start, you know, on people's names, knowing what you purchase and everything? So I think there is also an issue there in the business model. So those are my two points that I think crippled uh, Blue Apron, and I do believe they're a little crippled right now. Uh, for the following reasons. First, you gotta know who you are. If you're gonna be a distributor of high-end recipes, and some of these recipes were not perfectly easy to make, along with the ingredients in the, in the box too, then that's who you are. And you need to perfect that, master it and the model. So master delivering it, master scaling it, packaging it, which recipes are the best, and the model, because growth can cover up a lot of things, 
a lot of things. You have a great first month at a brand new restaurant. You might not know that people think that maybe your food was only a six or a seven. What if they're all, everybody else is there, it looked real busy, so they go. You don't really see below the surface that there's not a lot of those folks are gonna come back. You're just a new and interesting restaurant that's attracting a lot of customers, but you don't see below the surface what the truth is. Six months, a year from now, you're suddenly gonna see what's going on and realize, wow, what happened? At first, I had all the business that I could handle. Now, you know, I, I, I need more. I'm running at half capacity. Well, guess what? That same thing that you and I both see at restaurants and we notice it with our own eyes, it can happen here. So you have to master whatever you, who you are and master the model. How much marketing does it take to make this happen? Is growth covering up the truth about it and growing under control? If you're opening distribution centers and you're just running around with your hair on fire and here comes health department violations, you're not growing under control. There's not the proper controls there. And lastly, fix the right problem. And I wanna get into that. They did something right here. And that they bought BN Ranch, basically they bought fully assembled cows. These guys are experts in distributing food ready to be prepared in the kitchen. That is known as a disassembled cow, a dead cow cut into parts and they ship you some of the parts that you can cook. You don't buy a ranch and take the burden of raising, slaughtering, caring for, and going through that because this means this is your permanent cost. And if you are a distributor, know who you are, know what it's about. Why would you go upstream and buy a ranch? Why? Instead, you need to get all the purveyors competing with each other. And if you can't grow with the volume that they can give you, then you gotta slow it down so that every person gets the perfect product every time. You don't go out and buy a ranch. These guys were experts at the beginning in putting food and recipes into boxes and getting it shipped, not in raising food, whether it's crops or cows. The purchase of a, of a ranch, I believe, is just a sign that they're solving the wrong problems. I want multiple ranches competing for my Blue Apron business. I don't wanna to have to, whether it's a division or something that I'm personally running, maybe they, when they bought the ranch, they left the executives in place. Still, now, what if you, over, what if you go past the volume that the, that the ranch can generate? Now what? Now you go get another beef purveyor competing with your own cost. Nope. That's the wrong part. You are a distributor, you are a marketer, that's who you are. Master your shipping, master your recipes, master your marketing, master the mix of the recipes you put out there. But for the love of God, don't go back and now do something that you're not inherently good at. You don't have the core competencies. And with an early company, this is an easy mistake to make. So I think, I think they're gonna be stressed because I think that Amazon just has to walk two steps down the street to add recipes and to assemble kits and then you and I could get things from uh, Amazon to put together meals thanks to the Whole Foods acquisition and they need to figure out how much marketing it really takes or doesn't take because when they went from 77 to 795, they went from losing 30 to losing 47 to losing $55 million. So as revenues went up 10X, they actually lost another $25 million. On the surface, it looks like, wow, well that's only losing 55 on 800 and they lost 30 on 77. Wait a minute, someplace in here it should have scaled because this, this thing, NASDAQ, what they care about, what the analysts care about, earnings per share, scalable business model, being an expert at what you do. And that leads to right now, their 0-7 here in the, in the month of August, just closed, second month since the IPO, if you're watching this at some point in the future, 0-7, seven, seven analyst downgrades. No neutrals, no upgrades, seven downgrades by analysts who are saying what their opinion of the future is. So when you step back and you look at it, 
I think Blue Apron is a great case study where so much can be learned about growing fast in the beginning, knowing who you are, mastering it and mastering your model, then growing under control, and then along the way fixing the right problem and not being distracted to buy a ranch when what you buy is finished food product that can be put into kits and mailed to you and me so we can make a delicious meal at home. That's what you're good at. That's this week. Now I need a tasty pillow. Beautiful. Please subscribe to Valuetainment, the best channel on the internet for entrepreneurial content. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, and I hope I led you better than I found you.